morning. Everybody, why don't you guys stand with us? I'm going to invite you guys to do something different this morning. And we've never done this um, together. But I, I want to invite you, this may be weird, but I want to invite you guys to open your arms like this. All right. Our hearts, they follow our hands. Our hearts follow our hands. So as we open up this morning, I want to, I just want to invite you to open up your arms like this. And I want to invite you to let your hearts follow through that. So let's pray. God, as we open our hearts, would you pour yourself out upon us? Would you pour yourself out upon us? Amen.
in those last, uh, last verse, we behold the falling rain. Like the last line of that, we reach for you, we cling to you, O oh Lord. So uh, as you guys, some of, some of us have come in the room with a lot of stuff, a lot of junk. Um, some of us have left it outside of the room um, to try and forget it for an hour. Um, but I invite you to bring it all in right now to let it, let it out and give it to God this morning. He's not uh, going to be shocked by any of it, no matter what it is. Um, but in our mess, he does not run from us, but he runs to us. And he is with us in all of our stuff. So let us sing those words. We behold the falling rain like waters rise and flood this place we reach for you.
Amazing grace and unfailing love, that, uh, that is what has invited us here this morning, uh, that God's amazing grace has made it so that people like you and me, imperfect as we are, uh, who have experienced His grace or who are being drawn by that kind of unmerited, unearned grace, uh, can come and celebrate that and draw near to Him. And uh, in His unfailing love, which kind of stubbornly hangs in there with us no matter what, those are two truths that I know I need to be reminded of this morning. I hope that's an encouragement to you uh, that we belong here. Uh, and we belong here not because of our own goodness, but because of His goodness and His grace this morning. Um, I'm going to lead us in an opening prayer, but I, I know that especially after all these storms, uh, both uh, in Texas, uh, here in Florida, where we experience, and in the Caribbean, of course, um, has been ravaged by these storms. Um, and then you lay that on top of just the ongoing needs uh, of people in this room, people that we know. Um, I wanted to, in the middle of my prayer, I'm going to pause and just kind of let you offer up some silent prayers uh, on behalf of um, some needs that may be on your heart and mine. It may be a personal need, something that you're going through, uh, or it may be somebody that you know who was, uh, who's just kind of in a, in a tough situation. I just want to give us as a community an opportunity to kind of name those needs uh, silently um, in the middle of, of the prayer that I'm going to lead for us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do celebrate uh, your amazing grace this morning and your unfailing love. It, it is our hope. It's our identity. Um, it's our joy. And we are grateful this morning that it is the self-sacrificial love that has rescued us, that's won our salvation, that's given us hope and joy, and we are grateful this morning. So we praise you for that grace, and we praise you for that love. Uh, we're also grateful, Lord, that as we think about the devastation that these storms have caused all over, um, uh, we are just aware that uh, for the most part, we were spared um, catastrophic loss. And so we're grateful for that. There's just been so many stories of near misses and, and ways in which you showed up and were merciful and kind, and we're very grateful for that. Um, that's not been true for everybody. There have been a lot of tough, hard situations. There have been a loss of life. There's been um, widespread damage here in the Caribbean and Texas. And so we ask that in those much harder, difficult situations of loss and devastation, that your grace would be sufficient. We pray that you would mobilize uh, Christians in all those places to give sacrificially, to love sacrificially, to, to reach out to neighbors and to be your hands and feet and make sure that your presence is in each of those dark, hard, tough situations going forward. We think of um, Puerto Rico and, and just what, what is ahead for them. And we just ask that somehow you would bring good out of just a horrible situation. And Lord, you know the needs in this room, and so Lord, we just now pause and each of us begin to lift up our silent requests to you.
Lord, we are confident because of your grace and your promises that when we offer up our requests like we just have and we kind of stand in the gap and we lift up the people that we love and we cry out to you personally, we are confident that you hear our prayers and that you move in with your strength and your goodness in each of these situations. And so we anticipate and are anxious to return praise back to you for the ways in which you are going to move into each of these situations and show yourself to be our strong and faithful Father who cares. Lord, lastly, I, I just would pray that in, in, in with, with so much loss and so much struggle and frustration over the last few weeks, I just pray um, that you would fill us, your people, with just, just an undertow of joy, uh, just a, an unexplainable joy that doesn't try to pretend bad things didn't happen and doesn't try to kind of make things superficial or cliche, but that there would be a genuine sense of joy that rises up in us, even as we struggle with people and we weep with people and we face the inevitable um, hard things that we'll face, I just pray that you'd fill us with a joy that would point to something deeper, more significant, that would point to your presence in our lives. We ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, that's right. I got a double amen there. Good job on that. Um, all right, well, uh, I do want to extend a welcome to everybody this morning. Of course, it's great post to Irma to finally having some normalcy and to get back and be able to have the Vine service and have everybody here this morning is good. Um, if you are live streaming with us, want to extend a special welcome to you. I'm glad that you're participating and continuing in the community life of our church through uh, the live stream. And if you're a guest, I've already I've met a couple new people this morning, which is awesome. Uh, it, it's a, it's an, a, a great privilege for us always to see new faces and um, to have people join us as guests, uh, regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey. Sometimes people come and they're not even Christians or wouldn't even say they're Christians, but they're, they're here for a lot of different reasons. And uh, that's great. You're welcome. And we just want to say uh, that, that our hope is that you will experience some um, love and acceptance and, uh, and something of the love of God as you worship with us this morning. And um, the only thing we really ask, if you are a first-time guest, if you will, there's a, uh, a slip, an information slip in your worship guide. If you'll take a few minutes and fill that out, and you can place that in the offering baskets as they're passed a little bit later, uh, or you could take it out to the information table after the service and exchange that for a little gift bag with some information about our church. I uh, encourage everybody to fill these out and especially use these for the prayer concerns. Uh, I know there's probably an increase uh, of, of needs that we're all aware of. Um, feel free to jot those down. We have a team of people and the pastors who will pray over each of these needs specifically uh, every week. So this really does matter, and these prayer requests do get prayed for. Uh, so I encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity to fill out these slips. Uh, there's also ways to get involved in some of the volunteer teams that you can note on those slips as well. Um, just a, a few announcements. Um, today, there is a new member orientation, and so if you've been visiting the church or you've been maybe attending here for a long time, could be years really, uh, but you've never really crossed the line of kind of a formal commitment to really um, commit to the mission and the life and the community um, of First Presbyterian Church, um, then I invite you just to come. Even if you haven't RSVP'd, you can join us in room B. Uh, it's a free lunch. Um, and there's, there's no commitment uh, to just showing up. If you show up, you're just learning about what it would mean if you decided that you did want to join the church. Um, it gives, we cover a lot of information about who, what we believe, kind of what are our values, what are our commitments, and what it means to be a member. So we'd love to have you join us today. That's right after the morning, this, uh, this service in room B. Um, the second thing is our family nights, which is on Wednesday nights, are, are really kind of back up and running. We have um, child care and nursery, we have kids ministries and our teen ministry, but we also have um, adult classes and small groups, a lot of options, and so it's a great kind of middle of the week, connect with your church family, get kind of grow in your faith, um, connect relationally with people, so jump in if you haven't already, many of those things are just getting underway, it's not too late to be in one of those groups or classes. And then the last thing is, today we're starting, you might notice on the front of your bulletin, we're starting a new series called Basics. And over the next five weeks, Zach and I are going to be exploring with you um, just what are the basics of the Christian faith. Um, and this, th this is, here's why this is important. I think this hits probably everybody in the room. It could be that you're either not a believer or you're kind of a new believer. 
And sometimes just getting the basics kind of clear again in your mind. What, is it, what does it really mean uh, to be a Christian? What, is, what does it mean to have faith? Um, what, is, what is it that God's done for us? And what is it that we receive when we trust Him? Um, just getting those clear is great if you're at the beginning of your spiritual journey. But everybody else don't say, oh, well, that's, that's the basics. I don't really need that. Because here's the thing. We forget, don't we? We all forget some of the most important truths and promises and realities of what it means to be someone who follows Christ and who's experienced the love of God. Sometimes it gets monotonous. Sometimes we just get busy. And so this is going to be a great way to kind of reignite your faith, deepen your faith a little bit more. And one of the things we're doing as part of this is uh, because we're dealing with kind of the basics of faith and, and um, some, of the, some of the experience of, of grace at the very beginning of somebody's walk with Christ, um, we're going to have two Sundays where we're actually going to do baptisms that are part of the service. On October 8th and October 15th, we're going to do baptisms uh, in the service uh, for people who have never been baptized before. And so oftentimes you'll see infant baptisms and um, that sort of thing. And then when kids go through confirmation when they turn 13 or 8th grade class, uh, we do baptisms. Um, but it's not uh, as often that we get to baptize adults in here. And so this is an opportunity if you've never been baptized, uh, and maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, maybe most of your life, but you've never had a public experience of baptism, uh, then this is your opportunity to do that. Or if you're new in the faith and you haven't been baptized. Uh, so it's going to be a neat, a neat time to do that. There's also going to be an opportunity for a baptismal renewal or reaffirmation of your baptism if you have been baptized on the last Sunday of the series. So it's going to be a special series, a lot of neat opportunities for God to, uh, to really kind of show up and be a, a kind of experienced and expressed through a, a lot of different people in the room. And so um, if you're interested in being baptized, or at least you would just like to talk about uh, whether that's an appropriate next step for you, there are forms that are on the back tables as you leave this morning. You can grab one of those, and it gives you two or three different options. Um, of, of uh, signing up and registering to be baptized or at least have a conversation about whether that would be a good next step for you or not. And you can also go on our website uh, on the one of the main banner. On the main banner of the website, one of the drop-down options uh, is the basic series, and then there's an online form, uh, a version of that form that you can fill out and uh, let us know that you're interested in being considered for baptism. Okay? All right, well, kids, K through third, you can be dismissed, and as they're being dismissed, let's stand and welcome the folks around you. Hey, man. In the depths of despair, O oh Lord, I call for your help. Hear my cry, O oh Lord, pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to revere you. We might learn to fear you, revere, and awe you. I'm counting on the Lord. Yes, I'm counting on him. I put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord. The Lord is there, for, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. When I 
I read that, I hear HL, hope in the Lord. <laughs> I would hope that my hope for you guys is that you hear these words and you go, oh, that's to me. That's to me. That's to all of us. So hope in the Lord, for the Lord is there. For with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. And I love it. it ends with that, but it begins with from the depths of despair, O oh Lord, I call for your help. For my cry, O oh Lord, hear my cry, O oh Lord, and pay attention to my prayer. So I want us to be able to have that freedom in here. So if you're stuck and you feel like you can't vocalize it, listen to the words as we sing them. Allow yourself, this is a, a safe place to do that, for you to sing and to pray to God. These are prayers, in, in essence, for us to sing to God and for us to sing to each other. So there's not, it's not a, a necessarily of us inviting God in. He's already here. Um, he's here. So let us, let us, let him embrace us as we sing these words this morning.
Let's, uh, let's pray as we prepare for the uh, offering time this morning. Lord, even as we have sung those words um, that we give our all to you, um, you have led us through the storms, through the hard times, through uh, times of doubt and uncertainty, and in every one of those situations, you have shown up and been faithful and taken care of us, and we're grateful for that. And so, of course, Lord, with, with all of our life, uh, we want to surrender that to you, and that, of, of course, would include the resources that you have given us to manage our money. And so, Lord, every week we do this, and, and our prayer and our hope today again, Lord, would that this would be an act of worship to you, that as we give and as we're open-handed, uh, that you would receive the honor because it's our way of telling you that we trust you and that you've been a good father and we can be open-handed and we can be obedient and we can be generous with no fear about our future needs. You always take care of us. And so this is an act of worship. We pray that you would receive it as such and we ask that you'd help us as a church and as a community to, to steward and manage these resources in a way that makes your love real uh, here in our community, but also in places in our neighborhoods and around the world. That would be our prayer. And Lord, as Zach prepares to uh, open up your word for us this morning, we are grateful for his heart and his leadership. And we ask that, Lord, you would enable him to preach and speak and teach your word with great clarity, but also in a way that's consistent with the burden that you've put on his heart today, that he would share the things uh, that will matter most for this community. We ask that you would do these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so as the ushers come forward, I want to read this morning's scriptures. We kind of kick off this new series. We're beginning today, at least, in Genesis chapter 3. And I'm going to read the first 19 verses. It reads this way, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He shall bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will surely multiply your, chain, your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust. 
and to dust you shall return. It's God's word and it's trustworthy. Thanks, Kenny. Um, appreciate. That was a lengthy passage. And uh, my wife, when she heard that Kenny was going to read out of Genesis and I was preaching, she goes, uh-oh. Um, Genesis is my favorite book of the Bible. And so it's always kind of a buckle your seatbelt sort of situation when we get to Genesis. Um, you can ask the Agape class who's been with me in Genesis. We've been teaching, I've been teaching that to them for two years. Um, and we're not done yet. So we're going to be here a little while. Just, uh, you know, uh, first before you get into this, I just want to say it, it, like Kenny already had mentioned, man, it's really good to be back uh, in Vine. Uh, Irma kind of disrupting our worship schedule for the last couple of weeks has been, um, you know, last week was, was amazing. It was great to be together in the sanctuary and kind of share stories. That was uh, wonderful and, and a good kind of a healing time. We've had folks that have come up to all of us and said, man, it was just a really healing service, uh, so that was good. And then the week before, uh, we canceled service because Hurricane Irma was, was coming through. And I was one of those holdouts, uh, being a pastor, being the son of a pastor, being the son-in-law of a pastor, being the brother-in-law of two pastors. I am a holdout. You know, I was one of those that goes, we could, we could have church. It's not coming until midnight. I mean, we could have church, right? I mean, you know, no regard. But then, then we woke up and I kind of looked out the window and yeah, in fact, it was pretty windy. And I was like, yeah, maybe it's a good idea. We don't have church today. But um, Irma was uh, an interesting thing. It taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about people. It taught me a lot about um, just our ability to prepare for things. And it was interesting to watch people prepare because I think Floridians, we know how to prepare for stuff like hurricanes. I feel like we get pretty prepared. I mean, weeks in advance, people are starting to buy things. Batteries, uh, you know, hurricane snacks, hurricane snacks, and, um, you know, things like that. And, and then, you know, as you get closer in, as the track kind of moves closer and closer, and you realize, okay, yeah, it's really coming, then you really understand what's important. And one of the first things that kind of flies off the shelf and is really hard to come by is, is water. You know, we understand that clean, we kind of take it for granted in our normal life that we're going to have clean, reliable sources of water. That's very different than the vast majority of the planet. We take that for granted until there's something like a hurricane that comes through. And then we realize that maybe, maybe our clean and reliable source of water will be uh, disrupted. And so we go out and we stockpile uh, bottles and bottles and bottles of water. If you have two liters, you empty those two liters out and you fill up those bottles of water. You fill up your bathtub with, with water because you know that if you want to survive at the base level, you need water. I mean, next to air, water is maybe the most important element we have for, to, to survival. You know, without air, you're only going to last, you know, a couple minutes. Without water, you're just going to last a couple of days. And so we, we know we need these clean, reliable sources of water because that's one of the most foundational, basic elements that we need for survival. And then as the storm gets closer, we start to think about our emotional needs. You know, if we have to leave our home, what do we take with us? You know, if you were like my family, we talked about that. You know, if, we, if it comes through and we have to get out or, or there's like some major damage to our home, what are we taking? And, and so we packed suitcases full of photo albums and full of, you know, hard drives that have the digital copies of those photos. And in fact, that, that suitcase is still got the photo albums in it because I'm still a little bit nervous uh, about another hurricane just popping up on the coast. You know, who knows? Um, we know at the most basic level, what we need to survive physically and to survive emotionally. And it kind of teaches us a lot about ourselves. When I talk to folks following the hurricane, some people had some really bad damage, you know, damage to their homes. But almost without fail, when I would talk to them and they would tell me about, you know, holes in their roofs and leaks and water coming up from the ground and, 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 and walls that were ruined, they would almost inevitably follow it up, but we're okay, because we're safe. And it wasn't like this cheesy cliche, we know the right things to say. There was a genuine relief that at the most basic level, they had survived with their family and they were going to be okay. You know, that's, that's what we grab onto in times of real strife and, and real hardship. We grab onto those most basic things. And, and so when it comes to our spiritual life and our faith life, you know, a lot of times we get torqued up about questions like all over the map. 
You know, how does science and religion, how do those two things coexist? What about the historicity of the book of Exodus? Are you a complementarian or egalitarian when it comes to women in ministry? If you have no idea what I just said, that's okay. Count yourself lucky, okay? Do, do we fully immerse in baptism or do we sprinkle with a little bit of water? We do both, by the way. Um, do we baptize infants or don't we baptize infants? Are you a, a, a liberal or are you a, a, a fundamentalist? Are you mainline or are you an evangelical? We get all torqued up about all these different questions. And I'm just going to tell you right now, as we look at kind of the, the, the Western church, I got to say, we're in a crisis about all of those questions. And it's not that those questions are important. They are important, but they're not basic. They're not basic. Those questions do more to divide than to bring us together. And that's why when when Kenny and HL and I, we sat down, we started thinking about what what does our community need? We just felt like we needed to get back a little bit to the basics. You know, what does it really mean to have faith? What does it really mean at the heart of hearts to have faith? And again, it's not that those other kind of periphery questions aren't important, but it's a, if we focus so much on those questions, it's a little bit like preparing for a hurricane uh, by stocking up on peanut M&Ms before you have your water. And it's not that peanut M&Ms are important. They are. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Danny. Uh, you know, I understand. You've got to have your peanut M&Ms, but they don't matter at all if you don't have a clean, reliable source of water. And so today we're going to start this series. The next five weeks we're going to be talking about the basics. And I'm just going to spoil the whole series for you, okay? Because we're going to talk about three basic questions. We're going to be discussing three basic questions. And the first question is, why is the world so messed up? Why is it so messed up? And then the second question is, what has God done to respond to that messed up world? And then the final question is, how do we respond to God? In light of all of that, those are the questions that we're going to really kind of unpack over the next five weeks. And see, you know, ancient cultures since the beginning of time have been trying to unpack that that first question. You know, why is the world so messed up? And when they begin to unpack that question, they go back to the beginning, to creation, and they create the they they come up with these stories and these narratives to explain the brokenness in the world. One of the earliest uh, records of a creation story that we have comes from the Babylonians. And in the Babylonian narrative of creation, uh, humanity, human beings were created as the result of a bloody war between the gods of the land and sea and the great god Marduk. I mean, it's just a page turner right there. And Marduk wins. And the result of this war is human beings. Human beings are born out of this war in order to serve the gods in this battle. And, and, and fundamentally what the Babylonians were saying is the world is so violent, human beings are so violent because they were born out of violence. They were born in violence. They were created out of violence. And so, of course, they are violent. We are violent people. And you can understand how they would come to that sort of conclusion. But when we open the Bible, we see an entirely different picture. In the beginning, it says God created the heavens and the earth. God is the ultimate source of our creation. Now, I'm not getting into the science and religion debate right here. All I'm going to say is at the most fundamental level, we have to rally around the idea that God created us. Now, we can get, you know, into debates about, you know, literal 24-hour day, six-day creation, gap theory, how does evolution tie, that's all, again, periphery questions. What's important is that God created the heavens and the earth, and when he created the heavens and the earth, at every stage of creation, he looks at what he created and he said, it is good. It is good. And in verse 31, after he looks at the totality of creation, including human, human beings, he says that it is very good. It's not created in violence. It's not created with pain. It's not created with hurricanes and hardship. It's created very good. And at the center of that creation, he put human beings. He put Adam and Eve. And he put Adam and Eve in the middle of a particular neighborhood. We call that neighborhood the Garden of Eden. And he gave them a responsibility in that neighborhood to work it, to have responsibility over it. The Hebrew actually says that he gave them the responsibility to actually guard this this neighborhood. 
And, and this work, it wasn't like the work that you and I experience where, you know, we have bad days and sometimes we have jobs that we don't like. He gave them this work and this work was going to be a joy. He had created them uniquely to fill in that function to work and to keep the garden. It was not a, 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 a labor. It wasn't toil. It was a joy to work and keep the garden. And in the middle of that, that, that job, that, that wonderful, joy-filled job, he gave them one prohibition. He gave them one prohibition in the middle of the garden. He planted a tree and he says, from that tree that you can eat of any tree, but the tree in the middle of the garden, in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you cannot eat it. You can't eat it, and when you eat it, you will die. He gave them everything they needed to be not just happy, but fulfilled. Gave them paradise, and one prohibition, one rule, don't eat of the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, there's a host of questions that kind of pop into our minds when we start to read this, 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 uh, this passage. Why did God give them the tree in the first place? I mean, if God gave them paradise and he put people in the middle of that paradise to work and keep and guard, enjoy this, their, their neighborhood, this, this, this garden of Eden, why put the tree in the middle in the first place? Or, or better yet, why doesn't God want Adam and Eve to have the knowledge of, of good and evil? Why, why wouldn't that be a benefit to them? And, and those are important questions. And the answer really comes down to one word, trust. Will Adam and Eve trust that God has their best interest at heart? Or will they trust their desire for more? That's the fundamental question that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil prompts them to face. See, without that tree in the middle of the garden... There's no real relationship. See, the, the beauty of relationships is that, that, relation, that a relationship can be broken and can be lost. Without that tree, there's no opportunity to trust. And without that tree, there's, there's no opportunity to trust. And so everything that they would do would just be compulsion. It would be programmatics. It would be robotics. It wouldn't be out of a trusting relationship. We don't want that with our spouses or with our children. We want our children to trust us because they love us. And there's fundamentally a choice that they could leave us God gave them that choice to see if they would trust him you know lately um my daughter Hanny has been really enamored with puppy dogs uh, there, I guess there's a thing with little girls at some point they just have to want a dog I don't know what that is um we've always we've been cat people since Julie and I've been married we've been we've been cat people I had dogs when I was a kid but we have cat people and cats they don't trust anybody. Never. We've had our oldest cat, Scout, 15 years. She still doesn't trust us. It's weird. Um, you, she'll be there for a little bit, and she'll, you know, we'll rub her belly. But, man, if, if we raise our voice just a little, just a teeny bit, she scatters. And we won't see her for two days. If we ever take her to the vet, we don't see her for a week. She, like, gives us, like, the cold, you know, tail or whatever. You know, they don't have shoulders. So they got to turn their back on us. But dogs... Not dogs, man. They have this innate, like, trust. You know, and so Hanny, like, loves puppy dogs. She wants a puppy dog. And we're like, we can't have puppy dogs. We have cats. You know, that's just the way it is. Sorry, kid. Um, but I started thinking about, you know, why does she love dogs so much? Dogs get kind of playful. And I was reading up uh, online this past week about, you know, dogs and why they, they, there's such a difference between cats and dogs. And and I read this article uh, from a, an animal expert named Dr. Mark Burkhoff. And this is what he said. I'm just going to read this. He says, there, that's dogs, their wide eyes that pierce our souls tell us clearly that they just know. They just know we will always do the best we can for them. I find it easiest to think about dog trust in terms of what they expect from us. Now here it is. Their innate, ancestral and deep faith in us, their unwavering belief that we will take our responsibility to them as seriously as we assume responsibility for other humans. Basically, they expect that we will always have their best interest in mind, that we will care for them and be concerned with maximizing their well-being. They trust in an innate way that human beings are going to have their best interests at heart. Even if, you know, there are exceptions to this rule. There definitely are exceptions. Don't get me wrong. But for the most part, dogs just trust human beings. 
Uh, this morning, I was at Starbucks. I went to Starbucks, had a little time, went to Starbucks. A friend of mine was there out on the patio, and his dog was with him. And I'd never seen this dog before in my life. And as soon as I started talking to this friend of mine, um, the dog starts freaking out in a good way, like panting at me, like, you know, please pet me, please, please. You know, that, that little, they got that little high-pitched whimper sound, you know, that, that breaks your heart. And I'm not a dog person, but I went over to the dog, and the dog just loves it. I've never seen this dog. I've never fed this dog. I've never walked this dog. I've never talked to this dog. And I went over and that dog licked my hand to no end. Don't worry, I washed it since then. But it was like crazy. I was like, what is it with this dog? But then I go back and I'm, I'm reading this. I'm like, this is what the dog has, this innate trust, even though I haven't earned that trust. Cats, you have to like go over and above to earn their trust. And even then they don't give it to you. See, in, in, in Genesis... God had given Adam and Eve every reason to trust him. Had given them absolutely everything they needed. And the question was still there. Will you trust? You know, I think at the heart of this whole series, one of the questions that we're going to have to wrestle with over and over and over again is, do we really trust God more than we trust ourselves? And this is a complicated question, because even if you've grown up in church and you've been a believer uh, your whole life, um, we can say with our lips, yes, I trust Jesus, I trust God more than I trust myself, but do our actions really match that? And, and if you're not a believer, if you, you, you know, you're kind of new to this whole faith thing, this is a really complicated question because you're like, you know, I see human beings in front of me and they can earn my trust and I see what they do for me and it's more difficult for me to understand what God has done for me. But what we see in Genesis 1 and 2 is that God has given us the opportunity for everything that we need for life and, and, and gave, gave that to Adam and Eve and asked the question, will you trust me? And it's with this in mind that they broke that trust. In Genesis chapter 3, a serpent enters the garden. And we always think of this uh, serpent as Satan, and it's really just a word that means adversary. And the serpent definitely plays the adversarial part in this story. And he goes up to Eve and he says, did God really say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? That's how he puts it. Now, I'm just going to tell you what the serpent is doing right there is classic manipulation technique. One of, the, uh, one of the sins, and this is in all seriousness, one of the sins I really struggle with is being a manipulator. I really do. And I can tell you what the serpent is doing is trying to manipulate Eve. He's trying to get Eve to fundamentally question what she knows. Fundamentally question what she knows to be true. And he asks this question that he knows she's going to deny it. But, so in Eve responds, she denies it. She says, no, no. Um, God has given us every tree in the garden except this one tree in the middle of the garden and we cannot eat of that tree. And if she had stopped right there, everything, you know, we would have seen that she really does have a deep trust in God. But then she tacks on to it. She says, we cannot eat of it nor touch it. Now, I'm going to tell you, go back, read Genesis 1 and 2 again. God never says they can't touch the tree. And what Eve is doing right there is cracking the door open for a lack of trust between her and God. She's basically saying God's command isn't good enough. God's command not to eat of the tree isn't good enough. I'm going to say let's not touch the tree. And then Satan walks, the serpent walks or slithers right through that door. He says, you're not going to die. God knows that when you eat of that tree, your eyes will be opened. And you will be, here it is, like God, knowing good and evil. Now the irony of this statement is when God created Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 and 2, it says that he already made them like God. He created them in his image. But the serpent says, yeah, but he's holding out on you. He's given you everything in this garden, everything you need for happiness and life and prosperity, but he's still holding out on you. And Eve and Adam, who's with her, looks at the fruit and sees that it's good to eat. It's good to make them smarter, more powerful, and give them knowledge. And so they take and they eat it. They take and they eat it. And in that one act, they say, in effect, 
we know better. We trust ourselves. We know better than the all-powerful creator of the heavens and earth who spoke the cosmos into existence. We know better. And this attitude, this I know best attitude, I've got it all figured out attitude, I can do it myself attitude, this attitude, we call that sin. That's what sin is. And in this moment, it breaks the entire world. God shows up in the middle of the scene to check on his children, Adam and Eve, and he asks, where are you? Because they had hidden. They had run from, from God's presence because they, once they ate the fruit, they saw, wait a minute, we have no clothes on. We're naked, even though they had been naked the whole time. But now they feel shame. And so they run and hide. God had, had taken that out of the equation, shame and guilt, and now they had it. And God said, How did, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the tree that I told you not to eat? And this is classic, the very first marital spout, a spat. Adam says, she made me do it. That woman, and I'll, this, is, this is so gutsy, man. This is just as gutsy as it get, gets. This woman, by the way, God, who you gave to me, she made me eat. She gave some, gave it to me to eat. And then Eve passes the buck, the serpent the serpent, you, 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 the serpent, he's the one that's really at fault here. They broke trust. They broke their relationship. And the consequences for Adam and Eve and for all of creation were dire. God says to the woman, I will multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. But by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. There's an immediate break in the trust between God and the pinnacle of his creation, humanity. And in this break of trust, there's a seismic shift in how the world will operate. Adam and Eve were supposed to work and care for their neighborhood and joy, and now work has become toil and labor and difficult and something you got to retire from. The relationship between Adam and Eve, which was supposed to be perfect and symbiotic, they already begin to fight and butt heads. Their relationship with their children, their, their offspring, their future, it's, it's broken and cast in doubt. And the relationship that they have with the very earth that they stand on is broken. Romans 8.20, the great church leader and planter of the Apostle Paul, he says the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him, that's Adam who subjected it. Because of that moment. And that is the state of the world that we live in today. See, God withheld the knowledge, the full knowledge of good and evil and made it about trust and distrust. He withheld that because he knew that human beings could not handle it. It's kind of like that, you know, that, that scene in Few Good Men. They couldn't handle it. And guess what? We haven't been able to handle it since then. Because everybody knows what's right and what's wrong. And guess what? We all disagree on that. But only God's definition of right and wrong really matter, and it's too big for us. Romans chapter 1, it says, We exchange the truth of God for a lie, for our own desires, for what we want. And that puts us in conflict with others, and the cycle goes round and round and round. And you know what? We can look at Adam and Eve, and I, I, I remember Caleb and I talking about this story when I was first telling him the story. He's like, well, you know, if Adam and Eve just hadn't messed this up, things would be so very different. And you know what? He's right. Things would be so very different. You and I wouldn't be here probably. We wouldn't exist. And, and lest we think we're going to get ourselves off the hook and those no good evil Adam and Eve, man, they really messed things up for all of us. We're all part of the problem even now. Romans 3, 23, 4, all have sinned, every single one of us, and fall short of the glory of God. Psalm 14, verse 3, there is none who does good, not even one. We all add our particular brand of awful to the universe. We just don't like to own it. We're really good at pointing out the awful that you add to the universe. 
And I don't like to add, I don't like to point out the awful that I add to the universe. We all struggle with telling God in word or in our actions that we know best, that we can handle it. God, you take a break. I got this. But we can't. The proof is right there in in the world that we live in, the division, the, the, the garbage heap that is our political system, the brokenness in the environment, the brokenness everywhere that we look. It is evident that we live in a broken and fallen world. But God, here's the cool thing, God hasn't left us alone. See, God did tell Adam and Eve that if they ate of the tree, they would die. But God holds off. He takes his foot off the break of judgment. Yeah, he, he gives them consequences, but he takes the foot off the break of total judgment in order to demonstrate grace. And even in the middle of passing judgment on their sin, he provides Hope, in in Genesis chapter 3, before he talks to Adam and Eve, he talks to the serpent. He says, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, that means I will make you an enemy between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. In two verses, God declares war on evil not on us on evil and on the author of evil he says in the end i'm gonna win in the end evil will not have the final say in the end my grace god's grace is bigger than all the sinfulness and all the evil in the world he says that there will be a seed an offspring that will carry this grace to fruition you know, that story of a chosen one, you know, that's, that's what he's talking about. There's going to be a chosen one that will defeat all evil. That story of a chosen one, that narrative, that has captured the imagination of filmmakers and authors and poets and songwriters for thousands and thousands of years. That's why we have characters like Frodo Baggins from The Lord of the Rings. That's why we have characters like like Harry Potter. That's why we have characters like Neo from The Matrix. That's why we have characters like Luke Skywalker from Star Wars. I'm I'm saying somebody's language here, okay? That's why we have those, because deep inside we want somebody to defeat evil. And God says, look, I'm on the case. I'm on a mission that comes to ultimate fruition in Jesus Christ. God provides the hero, his own son. See, God had told Adam and Eve that when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. But he delayed. He delayed. He didn't strap them to the electric chair and throw the switch. He delayed to show his grace was bigger. Jesus died, and even even though he had never sinned, he took the sin of the entire world on his shoulders to the cross. Because the the sin of the world required that death. Jesus took that bullet because he, he loves us. And yet, he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay dead, but he conquered death and rose again so that anyone who trusts him, anyone who trusts in that story, who says, you know what, I have messed this up. I cannot do it. I'm giving it to you. They can exchange death for life. In Jesus Christ. In the next couple weeks, we're going to talk a lot more about what that looks like, but it's enough to ask the question now who do you really trust? See, God, God calls us to trust Him, whether it's at the start of a new journey of faith or it's a recommitment. But that call is for us to give up our futile ways, our, our, our futile life, trying to trust ourselves only to see it kind of fall apart. And answer the call that takes up a life that puts our trust in him. He is the solution to the problem. He can be the solution in our lives if we'll be willing to answer that call. Let's pray. Gracious God, we, Lord, we know that the world's messed up. We don't, we don't need reminding of that, but, but we need reminding that that wasn't the original design. Lord, help us to, to take ownership of our, our 
our particular sin and turn that over to you in trust that through Jesus Christ, you offer not just forgiveness, as great and wonderful as that is, but a conquering of the power of sin on our lives so that we can live differently. We can live reflecting your grace and mercy and love. Lord, we pray that you would overwhelm us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you guys join us? i
that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Let's go in peace knowing that is true and trusting our God with our whole lives. We'll see you guys next Sunday.